that's actually my father and his mother, about 1917, in uh, Niagara County, Patrick country, uh, about, uh, well, it was when that uh, garden was only about three years old. John Wesley Powell. I mean, not at the same time, but I mean, it was been, been um,
with our mission with the History Speakers Series, which is to bring in uh, scholars to speak on uh, issues that are prevalent to the cities of Rock Springs and Green River, uh, as well as uh, the great state of Wyoming and uh, more broadly, uh, the American West. And uh, I can think of nobody better to do that. But for those of you who aren't familiar with Dr. Roberts, I've got a small introduction for, for you, if I may. <laughs> Uh, uh, Dr. Roberts is, of course, from the University of Wyoming, uh, and he is Professor of History Emeritus there, uh, where he has been on the faculty since 1990, although he has informed me uh, this evening that he's a good local boy, so he has been here uh, almost your entire life, right? Close to uh, it. Yeah, so far. <laughs> There's much more to come, but, but as, of, as of so far, he's spent much of his time in the state of Wyoming. Uh, he's taught numerous courses at uh, the University of Wyoming in Wyoming history, and he's appeared on a number of documentaries, uh, one of which I just showed my students in today's class, uh, ironically enough. I said, there he is, so uh, come and see him tonight. Uh, he also contributes numerous articles uh, to the Wyoming State Historical Society's online wildhistory.org website. Uh, and to boot, his online New History of Wyoming is standard reading in our own History of Wyoming courses here at Western Wyoming Community College. Uh, I would like to take just one more moment before we get started, if I may, uh, to give a uh, a very sincere thank you to our co-sponsor, the Outlaw Inn, uh, one of the proprietors. Uh, Mark Anselmi is here tonight, so uh, I just wanted to say thank you. Uh, they have been very generous to us in our speaker series uh, since it first started in the fall of 2017, and we are very thankful to our friends. Uh, so without... <laughs> And so, without further ado, I will go ahead and hand the baton over to Dr. Roberts. Thank you, Mark, and thank you, Mark. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, and uh, I have decided to do something quite different than what many of you may expect. Many of you may expect that I'm going to be talking about the explorations of John Wesley Powell. But you know what? You all probably know more about it than I do because you're right here where it all began, just down the road here at Green River at the, uh, as the, uh, the Emma Dean and the other boats headed out down the, uh, down the Colorado, the Green Colorado River to uh, that big, those, uh, exciting things. But what I want to talk about is an aspect of John Wesley Powell that sometimes is forgotten, and that is his importance in actually setting the, the stage for development of the land and the water of the American West from the time he submitted this very influential report in 1878 to the Congress. And uh, up until the time of, of his death, he uh, met with a good deal of opposition from people who didn't agree with a lot of the things that he was setting forth. But as I'm going to be pointing out, a lot of those uh, rather visionary ideas came back and, and more or less authenticated the kinds of ideas that that, uh, that Powell had, showing that he did indeed understand the geology, the geography, the, uh, the, the weather, the, the, the climate, the, uh, uh, the, the land, and the water, in particular the water of the American West. And so I uh, titled it in a rather peculiar way because as I got to looking, at uh, John Wesley Powell's many accomplishments, it occurred to me that uh, I've had a lot of encounters with John Wesley Powell without even knowing it. Of course, I never met him, I have to, make, to tell you. <laughs> I may look old, but not that old. Uh, I 
he uh, was certainly a major figure in the uh, in the last uh, two thirds of the 19th century and just a bit into the 20th. But uh, to begin with, uh, here is a photograph of, of a family family ranch in, in Niagara County, and you'd say, well, what does that have to do with John Wesley Powell? Well, in the Arid Lands Report, as we're going to see in a moment as we get into it, in the Arid Lands Report, Powell makes comments about the size of homesteads, the, highs, the size of ranch steads that, that are essential in order for a family to, to survive. He did not agree with uh, the rather uh, parsimonious amounts of land that Congress had authorized for homesteads in the American West. Uh, six, uh, 104, uh, 160 acres might work in a place like Iowa, eastern South Dakota, eastern Nebraska, but you get out here in, uh, in the American West and 160 acres isn't enough to, uh, well, you might be able to keep one cow and calf alive for part of the year on that. But uh, <laughs> as Powell pointed out, those land areas were far too small for uh, any kind of uh, successful agricultural operation, whether it be ranch or uh, farm. And, uh, and therefore, he advocated that the, the amount of land be increased substantially. <coughs> Further, Powell pointed out something that would seem to be obvious to us in the 21st century, and that is you can't very well take uh, 2,640 acres and, uh, and square it off and put it in the middle of nowhere without any access to water. And so one of his, uh, his uh, uh, criteria for setting up a successful branch or farm operation was that the land not be divided up in traditional township range sections, squared off, but instead it, it is uh, it is was his idea that these areas got to follow these water courses, and uh, and you can see just by by those two two uh, suggestions that he's making in the Arid Lands Report where he's going to get a good deal of pushback because a lot of people in uh, less arid areas would say. You're creating an empire for, for individuals by giving them over 2,500 acres of land. And you're, you're letting them monopolize a river course by running the, the water, or running the land along the, the water course. And, uh, and as we'll soon see, it turned out that uh, Powell's, Powell's recommendation was prophetic in some interesting ways, and one has to do with the, the average size of a ranch or farm in 21st century Wyoming. Anybody care to guess what that average size is? Try 2,500 acres, give or take. That's uh, the size that uh, John Wesley Powell was advocated. <laughs> so anyway, that's my first encounter with, uh, with John Wesley Powell. And my second encounter with John Wesley Powell was when we moved to the town of Torrington in Goshen County. And I suppose there are a few people here at the Torrington. Probably not very many, because it's kind of like off the beaten path <coughs> out in this direction. But Torrington was, uh, was largely established because of the fact that uh, they were able to construct a canal, the interstate canal, that would bring water to uh, the very, uh, the very dry area there in, in uh, along the lower North Platte uh, Valley. But uh, it was an area where, where uh, 
up until about 1906, there wasn't much of anything except some some open range cattle operations. But in came the Interstate Canal, and the um, the citizens of Torrington in the area were so thankful for the federal government's help in giving money to build this interstate canal that uh, they looked to our uh, rather, well, he's a pretty controversial figure, our Senator Francis E. Warren, and they thought Warren was, he was just it. He was really a great guy because he used all the uh, influence he had in the Congress to get this interstate canal built. And they were so thankful that they even petitioned the Wyoming legislature to establish a county and name it Warren County. <laughs> well, the governor at the time was a guy by the name of Joseph M. Carey, who, of course, hated Warren. They were, they've been enemies for, for, by then, 15 years at least. And Carey would have none of it. And so the Torrington people said, well, we'll just create a county right next to it and we'll call it Cary County. How's that? Cary said, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to play that game. And so they settled on Goshen for rather than Warren County and Platt rather than Cary County. And uh, there you have a little bit of trivia you really didn't come here to hear about <laughs> concerning, Wyoming, concerning Wyoming place names. But, that was the second location of my encounter with uh, John Wesley Powell. And then uh, a third occurred when I was uh, uh, living in the Bighorn Basin, going to school in New Orleans. Again, uh, an irrigation project town that uh, came about as a result of uh, a uh, state-private partnership. Uh, the Hanover Canal Company that was organized to uh, to irrigate the lands around New Orleans, primarily for sugar beet uh, growing in the in the second decade of the uh, of the 20th century and then after that I was in Cody where the 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 uh, actually the the either the best example or worst example of what happens with uh, federal money being shoveled out to a uh, private uh, operation, one operated by a fellow that many of you will, will recognize, uh, Buffalo Bill Cody and his Shoshone Irrigation Project that uh, put together this tract of land along the Stinking Water River and along the banks of the mighty Stinking Water they were going to establish this, this rather huge dam and irrigation work. So uh, they, after the, the turn of the 20th century, they petitioned the legislature to change the name Stinking Water to Shoshone River. I can't imagine what they want to change. I mean, it's so picturesque to have a river running through your town called Stinking Water. It just, it just seems, like, seems like it's they lost some color by, by <laughs> changing the name. But anyway, for whatever reason they did that, the uh, irrigation project didn't do well. And in fact, the uh, federal government ended up rescuing the Shoshone Irrigation Project and uh, the Bureau of Reclamation that came about as uh, soon after, uh, was started soon after the death of of uh, John Wesley Powell, the uh, the Shoshone irrigation project was taken over by the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation, and uh, Buffalo Bill Dam, was then known as the Shoshone Dam, was uh, the first completed project that the uh, U.S. Bureau of Reclamation had taken on. They had done, they did other projects in Arizona and elsewhere. But this was one they took, they took on and pretty much rescued it. So there's my next encounter with John Wesley Powell. And then, uh, and then uh, after I graduated from high school in Cody, I 
went over 23 miles to Northwest College in Howell. <laughs> Gee, I just keep running into the guy all over the place. And of course, Powell was founded and named for John Wesley Powell, even though he'd never been there. He'd been, uh, he was actually he'd been dead for several years, but before the town was, was formed and named. And then, uh, let me skip a whole bunch of places, and uh, let me skip uh, a turn at UW and a turn in the Marine Corps, and, uh, and I ended up the editor of a newspaper in a town called Page, Arizona. And the name of the newspaper was the Lake Powell Chronicle. <laughs> and it was built right next to the Glen Canyon Dam. And in fact, the town had been the product of the, uh, of the Bureau of Reclamation. It, was a, it had been a company town. Uh, in fact, when I was there, it was still under the the ownership and management and control of the Bureau of Reclamation. So, so see, I just I just couldn't shake John Wesley Powell. And so, and so then there's another encounter with him when when uh, Mark asked me to come out and, and talk to you all about John Wesley Powell. So, see, he just he just kind of follows me around. <laughs> well, let me get going here. <laughs> uh, Powell's, uh, here is a, a classic photograph of John Wesley Powell. And here is the, the cover of the, of the Eric Lands Report. And there's one thing that uh, a lot of people uh, overlook <coughs> when they look at the Eric Lands Report. And that is that it was not unique for its time with respect to surveys being done by scientists in the American West. This was uh, the heyday of, uh, of scientific explorations in the American West. Here's a, um, here's a, a, a couple of, let me, let me jump in, there it is. The, uh, the, uh, same year, here is H.S. Uh, Scudder, who is uh, with the Hayden expedition, and he's doing uh, his uh, account of insects within tertiary rocks. And here is, a, again, a very pioneering sort of study that was being done in the American West in this period. And so it was a, a, a period that was alive scientific activity, exploration, and uh, new approaches to the, the, uh, the flora and fauna and the, the natural surroundings of the American West. Now let me get back. Because what I'm going to try to do tonight in the few minutes that are remaining is to, uh, along with you all, analyze the text and note the significance of the uh, Eric Lands report to the development of the American West, and then see if we can apply some principles to present day issues that uh, that surround us to this very day. I had to actually change this this afternoon because I had read an account in the paper this morning about the the uh, the commissioners of the Colorado River Compact making some pretty dramatic. Uh, Changes evidently. I haven't seen the, uh, the text of what they've done, but but uh, pretty dramatic changes in uh, allocation of water among all the lower basin states and uh, uh, lower basin states being uh, being California, Nevada, and Arizona, along with uh, those those also. Uh, compromises being made by the upper basin states of Utah, New Mexico, Colorado, and, and Wyoming, because the flow of the Colorado River has, as a result of this 19-year drought, has uh, declined to the point that there is uh, 
um, eight, uh, eight million acre feet coming down, and there's 11 million acre feet allocated. Now that isn't going to continue very long because you can't take more away from less and even me, not being a mathematician, I can figure that out, that you, that you have to have um, some, um, some changes in the way the, the, the uh, water sources are, are allocated if you're going to be to take, take more from, from less. And so, uh, so here we are essentially in a, in a really important crossroads in the allocation of water in the West and applying some of those principles that John Wesley Powell introduced us to way back in the late 1870s. Um, there are aspects that I'm going to talk about too here about how Essentially, what Powell was doing was advocating for communitarian allocations of land and water, but with the safeguards against individual greed and corruption. And uh, in many respects, he is a product of his time. Because if there's anything that besought the United States of the late 1870s and the 80s and the early 90s, was during this Gilded Age, a period of rampant political corruption of, uh, of big city urban machines, of uh, all kinds of, uh, of uh, abuses of power by railroad companies and other big uh, corporations. And so, so uh, in many respects, uh, Powell uh, throws in his his, um, his chits with the, the opponents of those, uh, those Gilded Age uh, transgressors. And uh, a lot of what's in the Eric Lambs report uh, represents his sensitivities to individual greed and corruption and recognizing that if any system is to rise, is to to fail, one way it's going to fail for sure is if uh, there aren't allowances taken to uh, minimize greed and corruption. Well, 1877 in Wyoming, when John Wesley Powell is preparing this report, it's 94% federally owned, it's 5% uh, owned by the Union Pacific Railroad, and you all being here in Rock Springs will will readily recognize that those are those those checkerboard sections, that 400 foot strip that goes clear across the country, but also those so-called checkerboard sections, 20 miles either side of the track that the railroad company was awarded by the federal government in exchange for for building this railroad, and uh, even as late as 1877. In Wyoming, there were only a few thousand acres owned by, by settlers. Now, that's not to say that a lot of the land wasn't being, being used by settlers, but a lot of these lands were, were uh, open range, and large cattle companies were, were uh, roaming herds across vast stretches of Wyoming. Now, of course, there were lots of people who uh, wanted to uh, transfer a lot of that federal land into private hands. And uh, as a result of some, uh, some manipulations of some of the later homestead acts, that did happen to a degree in Wyoming. Uh, T.A. Larson in his Magisterial History of Wyoming points out that the Desert Land Act served as more or less a license for or stealing land. But uh, as some critics at the time pointed out, uh, sure, people will try to steal the land, but we'll get them in the end because they're going to have to pay taxes on that stuff. So that's the penalty they're going to have to uh, endure 
for uh, for it, stealing the uh, stealing lands from the federal government, they're going to have to pay the penalty of uh, the taxes. Okay, well, let's go to the Eric Lands report, and I know it's really small on the right hand side, and I apologize for the small type, but I just wanted to uh, to point out a few passages from the Eric Lands report which, by the way, is quite lengthy. The first 140 pages, 120 pages, actually, are the, is the meat of the, of the report. And, uh, and a lot of the recommendations that uh, Powell makes are summarized frequently throughout those pages. And, uh, here is one example of uh, grazing lands. Powell, in essence, divides the, the lands into three usable units. And by the way, he doesn't even address mineral lands. He doesn't address the bad lands, as he called it. He doesn't address the, the national park that was in existence then by then, that's, that's Yellowstone that had been in existence for six years at this point. He doesn't address uh, uh, forest lands except indirectly, and we'll talk about that in a second. But he's mainly concerned with, with uh, land, but, he, but ultimately his main concern is the water because he recognizes that the land is essentially worthless if it's uh, if it's not tied in one way or another uh, to the water. So here at grazing lands, four square miles may be considered as the minimum amount necessary for a pasturage farm, as he calls it, 2,560 acres. He recognizes that uh, the open range has been and uh, utilized in vast parts of the American West. And uh, as he pointed out, it will not pay to fence the pasturage fields. Lands must be occupied by herds roaming. But the interesting part of his suggestion is their herds roaming in common. And so he doesn't subscribe to the proposition that eventually all of the open range will be fenced in and all of the open range will eventually be, be owned and controlled by individual owners. He's, he's advocating a, uh, a communitarian approach to the open range. And, uh, and he's uh, advocating this at first, initially anyway, uh, uh, with the local people having extensive control over how these lands will be administered. And it will be done for the benefit of the common, is what, uh, what he advocates. Now, later on, he does put in a, 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 a little safety check where he says maybe, maybe government will have to play a role if, in fact, it is shown that uh, the communitarian aspects of the, of the uh, process are, uh, are violated. Maybe there has to be a referee brought in, but, but he strongly advocated for uh, the local people to work it out among themselves and to do so on a on a uh, equitable basis among all of the among all of the, uh, the residents. So open range is what he he uh, allows for, but uh, again, with that one different uh, stipulation about the open range not being being the, the open range of the early 1870s, or even of uh, Wyoming in the days of the big cattle cattle. Uh, operations, absentee cattle operations in the 1880s, but that it be done uh, in a communitarian way. Here is a 
place of Shirley Basin Ranch that's, that is pretty far removed from, from water courses and uh, you can see the rain barrels positioned there where the, the, um, the rancher is, <coughs> is preparing for rather lengthy dry season. Well, again, as throughout the Eric Lands report, Powell celebrates community. And <coughs> he advocates that, uh, that these uh, residences of these farm communities ought to be, uh, ought to be grouped together ought to be grouped close together. Now, I don't know if he was thinking of uh, the, the English village arrangement or the New England village arrangement where, where uh, commonly the, uh, the common area would be in the center of, uh, of all of this, uh, of all of these privately owned homes. And uh, people would, uh, would uh, share the, the resources in common. I rather doubt that's in any way workable in the areas that he's really addressing. But that's uh, at least one of the recommendations that he makes in uh, the uh, Eric Lands report. Certainly, he recognizes the benefits of, uh, of these cooperative ventures in, in public Forest and timber, he separates out from these other lands. And uh, he, in essence, says ranchers and farmers really don't understand how to take care of trees. <laughs> uh, he doesn't put it quite that, that uh, starkly, but, uh, but he, in essence, says the division of labor is necessary, that timberlands must be controlled by lumbermen and woodmen, people who understand forests. And, uh, and it's in this area where, where uh, some of uh, Powell's preconceived ideas in the course of traveling the West comes to the fore. One of those has to do with, uh, with uh, these, uh, these colonies that he advocates the established and uh, that uh, cool customs are uh, uh, are forming and regularities are being made by common consent among the people in some districts already so he says maybe we don't have to do a lot to direct through legislation how these particular places are going to be but but, uh, but as he states here it ought to be possible for a poor person without any, any uh, means at all to be able to still come out to the, to the West and, uh, and be able to make a, make a life for himself and a family. And uh, the, the uh, suggestion is made that uh, this is to continue. And here is one of those assumptions that we might call into question nowadays because the assumption is that in essence these lands are boundless and uh, they're never going to fill up because there's just too much of it. And so forever it will be this, this quote, safety valve that another historian, Frederick Jackson Turner, um, utilized in some of his writings years later of, uh, of where the poor people of the cities and those coming in from, from elsewhere will be able to come out and, uh, and make a living for him or herself out on the, uh, out in the vast ranges of the American West. Well, um, um, dividing up the land here again, I'm not going to go into detail again, but I've already mentioned it. He is, uh, in essence, advocating for this, this uh, division of lands 
along river courses. And he argues that uh, why should this not be uh, familiar to Americans? Because that's how we've been uh, handling mining, particularly in California, since the late 1840s, early 1850s, that uh, you uh, mine along the vein and you claim the, the land, regardless of how the vein meanders, the person who uh, is uh, the first to strike that vein and to follow its course uh, has uh, the right to that claim, whether it look like a, a rattlesnake or a circle. The, uh, the, the process should be applied equally to, uh, to land with water courses on it. Why can't you use the tools of surveying to uh, be able to uh, Determine boundaries based on uh, based on water courses. Well, he's uh, I love this picture by the way. These are three three dudes. These <laughs> are my only uh, uh, one of them being uh, a grandfather of a certain person standing before you, and uh, one of the others being his brother. Boy, these guys are going to be the Humdinger Cowboys, three, uh, three uh, Nebraskans coming over from Fort Robinson to eastern Wyoming. And by golly, they're just going to show the Cowboys how, how things are done. <laughs> but anyway, uh, he is uh, again talking about uh, the certainty of surveys. He had a fundamental trust in numbers and in surveys and in scientific principles. And that's one thing that uh, makes him pretty uh, standard for explorers and, uh, and uh, um, people writing reports in that era, is that there was a, a tremendous faith in the ability of science to get it right. And all you had to do is to apply some of these mathematical principles, a lot of these survey principles, and uh, and eventually it will, it will get it right. It won't, it won't be uh, it won't be a, a disorganized disorganized mayhem out there in the, in the wilds of the West. In fact, uh, it will be very orderly because of the ability of surveyors to put some order onto the chaos of the lands. Well, um, I'm not going to go into the land acts because that's outside the purview of what I'm here to talk about. But uh, I just want to recognize the fact that land acts had been in uh, existence since, uh, the, indeed, the days of the American Revolution. One of the very earliest of the land acts, as many of you will know, was um, awarding soldier scrip to uh, <coughs> soldiers fighting in, the, in America's wars. That rather than the, the GI Bill for education, like some of us got as a result of a certain uh, period in history in the 1960s and 70s, the Soldiers of the Revolutionary Period, and well into the to the uh, 19th century, were awarded pieces of scrip, and those pieces of scrip that they would get on their discharge from service, they could then take to a land office someplace and trade it in for whatever land they wanted. And uh, I uh, actually found. I actually found a piece of soldier scrip from the War of 1812 that was used to uh, claim land in Wyoming. Gee, War of 1812? I mean, what was Wyoming at the time of the War of 1812? Louisiana. It wasn't belonging to anybody but the native people at that point. 
on a map that might be partially owned by Spain and partially by Britain and partially, partially, partially by uh, the U.S. Through the, through the Louisiana Purchase. But, uh, but here it is, uh, uh, a, a tract of land that was, that was awarded to the widow of Henry Poole, a private in Captain Clune's company of the New York militia in the War of 1812. And, uh, and here it is, signed by President U.S. Grant, and it's for a tract of land that is now the spot where the American Heritage Center stands on the campus of the University of Wyoming and uh, the Laramie Cemetery is on land that was originally claimed under Soldier Strip. Um, I looked and looked and looked and I couldn't figure out where those Soldier Strip were, were filed in Sweetwater County. I looked because that, there's a, that really nice BOM site that allows you to to go in and look at the original homesteaders and the original entry into every, well, I think every county and every district in the American West. Has anybody used that? That site is really a fun one to use. You can, you can look up your, your ancestor and figure out if he or she had a homestead. There's one uh, really interesting homestead in there for this fellow by the name of Abraham Lincoln, who got a uh, got some soldier script for fighting in the in the Black Hawk War, and he took that soldier script and plunked it down on some land in what's now Council Bluffs, Iowa. So there's some Lincoln land there in Council Bluffs, Iowa that uh, that he was able to claim uh, from for the soldier script. He obtained by uh, fighting in the war. That's yeah. the grant signing that in 1870 for a widow of the War of 1812. Uh, well, uh, the widow of the War of 1812, she was dead by then. Yeah. Even. What had happened is that script had ended up in the script market and had been traded around, traded around. And in fact, there are newspapers in the, in the 1840s, 1850s where there are, like in the classifieds, it says, wanted, soldier script. We want it, we'll pay you top dollar for soldier script. And they tried to accumulate all of this. Congress finally had to do something about it when the group down in uh, Alabama and Mississippi tried to uh, use soldier script to control a whole district. Down there was the Yazoo, land scandal and some of you from that area will remember they uh, they tried to essentially take a uh, soldier script and just rip off whole districts by, by cornering the market uh, for those for that script but anyway uh, this thing was probably sold 15 times between the widow and the fellow that bought it in Laramie in 1875 and uh, he may have had it for as uh, for as briefly as just a few months, because he could have paid for it on the market and, and then plunked it down. Finally, and thankfully, uh, <coughs> the corrupting influence of the soldier script became evident, and uh, Congress ended the, the practice, and hence there were. There were rules that were that were given for Civil War soldiers to make extra claims under the Homestead Act of 1862, and so so they were given shorter time periods to perfect the patent, all kinds of things that would make it possible for them to uh, to benefit. But soldier script was just too much out of the question. Okay, well, uh, the average size of, uh, of ranches, farms in Wyoming in 1880. Now, of course, this does not take into account all of that uh, open range that all these places were using. Because mostly they would claim just one little piece and then they would run.
run all the all of the, uh, the livestock and the, on the open range. But uh, the average size is 272 acres. And uh, here is John Wesley Powell Eck, uh, advocating for 2,500 acres. Well, eventually it happened in 2010. Had to have waited a while for it to occur, but uh, the average size of uh, the 11,000 ranches and farms in Wyoming is uh, now in excess of 2,700 acres. Okay, a couple of quick things about Powell. Um, that is, uh, Eric Land's report made really clear, and that is uh, that he used uh, measurements taken at military posts and along the railroad to dispute the claims that were being made by scientists who were arguing that uh, rain follows the plow. Why, all you have to do, folks, is to, uh, is to buy this land that looks really awful right now, but once you plow it, rain will start falling because when you, when you release the precipitation, the moisture out of the, the virgin soil, suddenly rain falls on that location. And of course, there were some uh, people who included, uh, an, I'm sorry to say, our one of our favorite surveyors of the American West, F.B. Hayden, of the Hayden Expedition. Hayden went to work later in life for a railroad company and actually advocated that rain indeed follows the rails. And his proof was pretty hard to uh, dispute because he said, take a look at where railroads run. There's always rain along those, those areas. <laughs> where there aren't any railroads, there isn't any rain. And so it goes to, uh, to uh, show that as scientists will agree, if there's a rail, then it must be drawing the water out of the sky into that uh, into that ground. Well, uh, uh, John Wesley Powell none of it, and states categorically in the, the uh, in the uh, Eric Lands report that this is just so much baloney. That's not that's not the way the process works. Well. Um, let me quickly get to the very end of this uh, portion of the, the Air Lands report. Um, um, Powell does advocate for reclamation, but in the Air Lands report, he's rather timid because he doesn't advocate for large reservoirs, large dams in the Air Lands report. That's to come later. He's advocating for small community projects along manageable uh, streams and rivers that will help uh, individual farmers, groups of farmers, not necessarily those gigantic public works projects that came into existence after the, the turn of the 20th century with the creation of the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation. He does uh, go into all kinds of detail about setting up irrigation districts and how these things are going to be run in a, in a democratic fashion. Because it's more important, as uh, Powell says, to, uh, to treat the water democratically than it is to even treat the land in that, in that manner. Uh, he, uh, he insists that uh, the water has to attach to the land and there are a lot of places like Wyoming where that particular principle was uh, adhered to by, by uh, uh, the Constitution. And uh, the water rights of uh, Wyoming, uh, you can certainly see some of the influence of John Wesley Powell on uh, Dr. Elwood Lee's advocacy for, for uh, prior appropriation doctor prior appropriation in, um, in Wyoming. Okay, land had to be near a water course, again, and not in straight lines, 
and uh, put that picture in because I like that. It's a photo of the chief crossing the Green River out here. Um, here's the surveyors again doing their survey. He again uh, goes into some detail about management districts of land, but again, his primary concern is not so much in land as it becomes clear in the Merit Lands Report. His concern is getting water to that land. That's the objective. And as he says, problem, problems don't come with land monopolies, but with water monopolies. And so every Every uh, every law must have an eye toward guarding against a water monopoly. Uh, crazy districts again. Uh, avoiding corruption again throughout. He talks about uh, the corruption coming from government surveyors and land people that are affiliated with the federal government because it was common practice in those days for a political party to take power, fire everybody who is involved in the land office from the old political party, bring in their own, and uh, then their own would plunder the, the public domain for four years, and then the parties would change, and then another batch of scoundrels would replace the earlier ones. So he's, uh, he's urging that uh, the uh, form be set up so that the individuals will be paid, paid by salary, not by contract, and thus every means possible should be used to keep land policy and water policy out of uh, partisan politics and out of the corruption that in those days was uh, a central feature for much of it. Well, what's not in the room? There's very little about mining, surprisingly. There's nothing about national parks and forests. There's an assumption that certain lands, bad lands, are, quote, useless and irredeemable. <laughs> and, uh, and he doesn't really go into detail as to who's going to make that determination, which uh, I think opens it up to the kind of corruption that he was, was worried about. <laughs> And then there's almost nothing about the native people. Here's some Indian cowboys from a bit, uh, uh, this is from uh, uh, south uh, eastern Washington. Well, surprisingly a little about mining, and yet we have the coal regions doing very well. Here's Rock Springs, this is 5,000 tons a day, bituminous coal coming out of a uh, being shipped up to Butte, Montana to be utilized by customers in, in Butte. So, so uh, surprisingly little is mentioned about these coal lands. He just simply accepts them from the overall uh, recommendations of the, of the Earth Lands here. And then here's the part that is a little galling because it's based on essentially no evidence or slim evidence at best. Because he says, why do we have forest fires in the American West? Well, you know, there wouldn't be forest fires if we got rid of all the Indians. Because it's the Indians that are setting all the forest <coughs> fires. And you go, huh, that's odd. We have lightning these days. <laughs> why didn't they have lightning then? We have sparks jumping from equipment, like railroad trains. We have all manner of accidents that occur. And, uh, and I use this painting as tending the talking wire uh, painting because it sort of is reminiscent of, of uh, some unfortunate realities about fires in California, not being caused by Indians, but in actuality caused by well, this is telegraph lines, but you get the general principle. That's kind of the symbolism I was trying to uh, trying to evoke here. Okay. Well, uh, he says uh, uh, it being usually attributed to the wanton desire on the part of the Indian to destroy that which is of value to the white man. The 
fires can then be greatly curtailed by the removal of the Indians. Okay, let's remove the white meat at the same time. <laughs> Uh, the macro view of, of the arid lands, these are the basins that he identified in the, in the arid lands report. I'm just going to skip over this quickly because we're totally out of time. Um, average annual precipitation today shows the uh, beyond the 100th meridian, where um, Powell was making the assertion that uh, it's beyond the 100th meridian where we have the biggest problems with aridity. Uh, except for, of course, west of the Cascades, that he, he does examine from the study as well. The irrigation projects, uh, here is the Powell Post Office, the Powell Post Office. Uh, here are the massive dam projects that, that uh, it may be that Powell might have anticipated these, but as a, a general visionary, I don't find it in the Arab lands that he's advocating for these massive dam projects. Here's a, I think I'll just end with this one. This is a photograph of Page, Arizona from the air that was commissioned by the editor of the Lake House Chronicle in uh, 1972. And, uh, and uh, you can see there, this is a town that was founded in 1957. And it was, here is the, here is the dam, there's the bridge, there's the town of Page, and here is the, the beginnings of the uh, Black Canyon, or the Lake Powell, behind, uh, behind the dam. So, uh, not a lot of trees, still not a lot of trees, but uh, again, um, a place that's there largely because of at least the, the spirit of John Wesley Powell and uh, whether it's being properly channeled at this particular time in these big massive projects or not, uh, it certainly uh, has its, uh, has its uh, uh, roots in, in Powell's writing and in Powell's advocacy for, for utilizing water for, for bringing up to 2.5% of the arid lands of the American West to uh, agricultural standards. Uh, it's pretty right. About 2.5% of the West is utilized for that. What uh, Powell obviously didn't recognize was the huge population increases that would come with the uh, Okay, I'm going to stop there and just open it up for, for questions. I'm not sure what we have for time. Uh, we, we've got as much time as, as you would like to take for that. Okay. Absolutely. Is, is, okay. is there a question? Yeah. You can see a lot of this in the uh, land ownership maps, especially when you get away from the checkerboard area, where there's water, there's homestead, there's private land. Not water, it's BLM. That's right. One thing that I've observed is that, uh, is that a lot of what Powell was advocating really didn't hit the public consciousness until about the time of the Dust Bowl and the aftermath of the Dust Bowl. And one uh, organization that I often point to as trying to make up for the failures of not following John Wesley Powell's advocacy for, for rivers next to land is the, uh, the, uh, the RA, the, the uh, RA. No, RA, the, the Resettlement Administration. It was a very short-lived New Deal project that was designed to save Western bankers 
and it saved a lot of Wyoming bankers because what they did was to declare that these lands that had been mortgaged to banks were essentially unlivable because they weren't close enough to water, they could never be productive, and it would be to the to the benefit of everybody concerned, the, the supposed farmer could be relieved of the responsibility for paying off a loan on land that couldn't ever come to fruition. The banker would be saved because how was he to know that this land after a drought was totally worthless? And, uh, and so the reseller Resettlement Administration uh, in Wyoming. The best example of the Resettlement Administration is the Thunder Basin National Grasslands up in uh, Campbell, Converse, Weston, Niagara County, and that area, where those vast stretches of lands had once been homesteads. And they had had actual homestead communities there that were just simply simply just completely destroyed by drought. And so the best way the federal government saw in the resettlement administration, which by the way only lasted, I think it lasted three years, but the theory was to rescue everybody concerned and then turn those lands into conservation lands, like the uh, Thunder Basin National Grassland is. So, so uh, there were or efforts like that that were were put into place because we recognize this, this, these problems. Yes. Can you summarize for us what happens when he releases this idealistic, communitarian against the grain report to Congress? You know, he's got this vision. What? Okay. He what rela happens? he releases the report. He has been celebrated in the country for his great explorations. And so everybody says, hey, this guy needs to be taken seriously because look at the wonders that he did going down the Colorado River and the Grand Canyon and all of that twice. Why, why uh, uh, we've got to listen to this guy. And indeed, one could say that the Air Lands Report represents the high water mark of respect for Powell on the part of, of uh, members of Congress and uh, I hate I don't like to use the term but but the so-called Chamber of Commerce uh, people in the American West that were that were really um, unhappy with the fact that this report might actually be um, heard by people and they might pay attention and they might not come out and they might not want to take out a, a uh, 320 acre homestead and see if they can make a go of it. Um, the thing that was going against Powell at the time was that it was an unusually wet period in much of the West in the late 1870s and the early 80s. And uh, the drought didn't really kick in in lots of places until 1886 in Wyoming, and uh, and a bit later in some of the other districts in the West. And so, so at the very beginning, people just sort of sort of uh, brushed it off and said, "Well, this is just this is just a way that Powell is advocating for big ranchers to come out and dominate the water and dominate the land by giving one person." 2,500 acres and all the water, all along the water course. Why, that's just absurd, people argue. Uh, it's a little bit like, um, I've uh, often told this story back about 10 years ago when we were seven or eight years into our current drought. I uh, was uh, walking out of the history department next door to the anthropology department and uh, happened to encounter our old friend George Frizzen, who I'm sure is a, uh, well known to all of you out here in this area of the state as well as in Laramie. And George Frizzen, the, the uh, 
anthropologist that he was, I said, George, I'm sure going to be glad when this drought is over and we can get back to normal. And boy, did that ever set off George. <laughs> he said, normal? Roberts, don't you know that normal is the drought? <laughs> and then he proceeded to point out a very scary statistic to me that there had been a hundred year drought between 1300 and 1400 in Wyoming. And it's during that period when there's virtually no evidence of human habitation in Wyoming. Why? There wasn't any water. Why would anybody stay? And so as I headed toward my car in the parking lot, I was reflecting for a minute, uh, gee, I hope this is not the beginning of that hundred years <laughs> because I'm gonna have to, uh, I'm gonna have to uh, rethink this whole business of, of what's normal and what's not when it comes to uh, precipitation in the West. And indeed, uh, in all seriousness, us worldwide are going to have to start thinking about that as we, we get uh, uh, more and more, more and more into uh, the adverse effects of global warming as a uh, hundred year drought of George Frizen's anthropological memory from 1300 to 1400 might uh, not even hold a candle to what's uh, awaiting us if we don't do something about uh, the, the, the current conditions. That's my little polemic. <laughs> yeah. Well, but this is very You're welcome. Thank you. This is awesome. farming 
area of uh, Owens Valley in California, a couple of hundred miles safely removed from Los Angeles. And the next thing they know, here is a fellow by the name of Mulholland who shows up on the scene and um, to make a long story short, there's an aqueduct built all the way down to LA and uh, there's not a drop of water left in the Owens Valley in order to uh, slack the thirst of, of Los Angeles a couple hundred miles away. And it was an object lesson for a lot of people, but, uh, but we have to keep vigilant because that can happen to us. These transbasin diversions can happen to us. Us meaning Wyomingites, because that's who I think about it. Probably ought to be more, more generous to the whole world, but I think of us first for some reason. But just, I don't know, just kind all of politics fits. is local. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And water drinking is local too. So uh, since I can no longer drink whiskey like I used to, uh, it's water and it's important now for me. Sandhill Cranes. 
they would just love to do that. But what about Nebraska? It's 95%. Oh, well, we use all of ours. As if we don't use all of our 4.5% or whatever. But, um, but at any rate, uh, at any rate, that's going to be a real, a real increasing problem. Uh, this is a very unusual problem with the floods in Nebraska right now. But when it gets back to the the norm, and I trust that there will be a norm, uh, we'll be <clears throat> we'll be I think suffering the consequences of, of um, the needs of Nebraska and our inability to get them to sign on the dotted line an agreement like uh, we were able to do with the seven with the six other states in the Colorado River and the Compact. We have some interesting problems with the Powder River that some of you might be familiar with, uh, given that uh, we had this, uh, this uh, issue come up with water coming from uh, a lot of the, uh, the uh, coal bed methane Levels. And the water was at a very, very high mineral content that the state of Montana complained that we were not shipping potable water into Montana, that we were shipping this stuff that had been polluted by, uh, by coal bed methane. And, uh, and that's been an issue that's been kicked around. One part of that case, and then we lost the other part. So we'll be continuing to watch that as it works its way through the the uh, the uh, ninth and tenth circuit courts of appeals in the next six months or so. Okay. Any other questions? Well, thank you, Dr. Rob.